Hi everyone, this is Tim Melvin of the Tim Melvin Deep Value Report and the Banking on Profits newsletter coming to you from down here in Central Florida where we're going to have our first 90 degree day of the year. I know that some folks don't like that. I absolutely love it. The warmer it gets, the happier I am. So looking forward to a great day down here today. Had a rough day on Friday in the stock market. The market got absolutely pummeled, turned a, turned a positive week into a losing one. We're going to close down about 1% for the S&P 500 for the week, it looks like. You can take your pick of things to blame here, guys. I heard earnings. I heard oil prices. I heard uh, changes in the way China allows securities to be traded, putting margin limits on certain OTC stocks. Um, weak U.S. economic data came in for its share of the blame, as always. Uh, but, of course, that's also a positive because to many traders' mindsets. Because if the data is weak, then the Fed can't raise interest rates anytime too terribly soon. Um, I have no idea why it sold off. I'm going with more sellers than buyers. But apparently, I let you guys down in a very big way on Friday. Uh, judging by my email box, because I keep pretty close track of who's doing what out there in, in the newsletter kind of advisory thing. And I get lots of emails from different uh uh, newsletter publishers I mostly to stay up on I said trends and marketing ideas and suggestions because I'm not real good at all that but apparently when we have a big down day like that I was really supposed to send you guys a flash alert semi panicky this is what you need to do right now to protect yourself from further declines or what you need to do to position yourself for the inevitable rebound I need, I need to be right on that with an instant email telling you what to do right now uh, gee, I'm sorry guys it's, I don't think that way I don't move that way I'm never going to do that but I can tell you what I'm doing this afternoon right now to prepare for next week First, I've got the Orioles and the Red Sox. They're coming on uh, right around 1 o'clock. So we're going to be watching that while we're reading a book. And my wife has insisted that I'm going to love called The Dark Wake by a guy named Eric Larson. It's about the sinking of the uh, Lusitania, apparently, right before World War I. It's supposed to be a great book. going to read that and I'm going to order and download to my Kindle so I have it ready for uh, hopefully tomorrow. I don't know. Maybe I'll get done The Dark Wake today. Uh, there's a new uh, Billy Martin biography called... Uh, uh, flawed Genius by uh, Bill Pennington, who of course used to be a uh, baseball beat writer up there in New York. I can't wait to read that thing. So that's my day. Pretty much baseball, books, got a few errands. The dogs and I will do a lot of walking. So if you want to copy my lead, that's what we're going to do to prepare for next week. We'll see what the market does. We're in a great position with lots of cash to react to whatever it does on Monday. We'll see. And one of the interesting things of the last couple of weeks, of course, was Stanley Druckenmiller. Uh, they got a hold of a speech that he made back in January and came on and he made follow-up remarks on Bloomberg with Stephanie Roll. And it, basically, the upshot of it was, and I don't want to go into the whole 45-minute talk that he gave, but he doesn't think QE is going to end well. He thinks it's going to be a disaster, that rates should be higher now, we should just go ahead and take the hit, and it's not going to be real pleasant for the economy or the markets going forward. Now, we'll see if he's right. I mean, there's a lot of people, Seth Klarman among them, uh, Sam Zell, uh, just a whole bunch of folks. Ray Dalio uh, recently made uh, similar remarks that the end of QE could uh, have some negative impact for the markets. Do I think it will? I do. I think the Fed's in a horrible box. Um, they've, their models, uh, the markets responded correctly to their models and what they thought they would happen with all this quantitative easing and stimulus, but the economy has not responded in the manner that they hope. Now, do I know for sure? Absolutely not. I have no idea. Uh, this is uncharted ground. We've never been here. It's a strong possibility. When will it happen? There's only one correct answer. I don't know. So we, again, we have to see how all this plays out. Now, he did say something else. Uh, he was positive about crude oil. He thinks it's too low that we eventually get the rebalancing of supply and demand and crude oil moves higher. That's really interesting because, as I remarked in the piece that I sent out Thursday, Andy Beal is also staffing up down there at Beal Bank in Dallas and uh, in Nevada to invest in oil energy. This is the first time we've seen him actively in the market since like 2010, 2011, when he was snapping up all those um, distressed mortgages and banking assets. He only comes out to play when disaster has struck. 
Granted, he's on the debt side, not the equity, but him being interested in the positive comments that we got from another very smart guy uh, like Stanley Druckenmiller do give me a little bit of hope for the long-term performance of the oil stocks that we already own. Wouldn't be opposed to owning anymore, but I can't find anymore. The ones that are cheap are not safe at this point, and the ones that are safe are not cheap. We've got plenty. If we get a sudden oil rally, we're going to be you know, pretty happy campers. So uh, anyway, looks like we may be seeing the long-term potential of the oil stocks finally start to play out in a positive fashion. Again, we'll see what happens. We have lots of oil stocks. We have lots of cash. Either direction is probably okay with us uh, in the near term. Now, interestingly, in the last couple of weeks, I, was, I forgot to do a video last week, and truthfully, there was just a lot going on around here with family in town, uh, a couple of baseball games we wanted to see, and I, I forgot to send out a video, so I apologize for that. But we've been doing a lot of screening and testing and just sorting through ideas and kind of what works and what doesn't, and we've made some interesting discoveries. We really did a lot of work with uh, the Ben Graham two-factor model. He... Uh, uh, tested this and talked to a reporter about it in 1976, not too terribly long before he passed away. It was a real simple model. Uh, stocks trading under 10 times earnings um, and with a debt to equity ratio of 50% uh, or less. So reasonably financed, reasonably cheap companies. This thing's been a great performer, guys. Outperformed the market in 12 or 15 of the last 15 years. Outperformed it in up markets, outperformed it in down markets. Pretty consistent performance. It's a, designed to be about a 30 stock portfolio. It does stay fully invested pretty much all the way through. Uh, never raises any cash. So you do take the big dips. Uh, we tested this back in 1999. You take the big dips in the early 2000 and in 2008. Not as bad as the market, but enough to hurt. <laughs> okay. So it's a fully invested portfolio that is going to participate in the downside to some degree. Returns are fantastic. Graham said that he tested it for 50 years, from 1976 back to 1926, and he, about 15% a year was his number. Uh, Tobias Carlyle and Wesley Gray tested it for their book, Quantitative Value. They found 17%. My tests over the last 15 years showed about a 16.5% long-term rate of return. It's a market-beating portfolio, very, very low turnover. You really only really rebalance this thing about once a year, and you sell stocks when they've gone up uh, by 100%. Other than that, you just kind of roll with it, rebalance it once a year. Great conservative portfolio um, for beating the market. A little more concentrated than we usually run, but it's a solid approach to, to the stock market. And one of the better performing ones uh, was the Piotrowski stocks below book value, Piotrowski F score in the top third, and then Altman's Z-score indicating that there's not going to be any financial distress for this company over the next couple of years. This was a great screen. I've used this a lot, uh, but I never had really just done this type of formal in-depth backtesting. You look at the 5, 10, and 15-year periods for this thing, and they're all right around that 20% annual area that we're all trying to achieve. Um, it is a very concentrated portfolio. The only times you'll have much more than about 25 or 30 stocks in your portfolio is following a full-on blowout crash, uh, as in 2008 and, of course, 2000. The drawback to this model is you were just out of the market from late 1999 to 2002. Now, I hear everybody saying, oh, my goodness, what's wrong with that? I mean, that was a terrible time. It takes a lot of patience to sit on the sidelines for three years. Most people don't have it. Know that going in, you know, in 2006 and 2007, this thing was less than 20% invested. It can be a tough model to follow, but it's a wildly successful model for exactly that reason. Uh, you're picking safe and cheap stocks that explode when markets recover, and um, you're out of stocks for the most part when things get pretty extended. Um, so that's a great model, and I've been using it. Now I'm going to really start paying a lot more, even more attention to it. So the three-factor model that's always I call my basic approach, low price to book value, very low um, uh, debt to equity ratio, and a high current ratio perform extraordinarily well. You're, again, you're in the high teens uh, with a very pronounced market timing element as markets move higher. Uh, you're, you're on fewer and fewer stocks. As markets come down, you're buying more and more stocks. So you're buying low and selling high, which sort of was the idea of this thing. Um, again, very pronounced 
uh, time in your pack. Very lumpy returns here, guys, okay? In a year or two following the sell-off, you make huge returns that then come down to closer to be in line with the market. And as you get to the end of an extended bull run, like the late 90s, uh, 2006, you're starting to be underinvested and lag the market. Not substantially, but noticeably, okay? Um, so again, that's the value timing effect. The returns to this are very lumpy. I've always known that. Some people get into it, get excited. They read The Intelligent Investor or, or some other book on value investing. They get excited. They don't realize these returns are quite lumpy. You're, not, you're never going to just beat the market by a percentage or two a year. Some years you're going to kill it. Some years it's going to kill you. It's over that five and ten year period that you need about to worry about beating the market. Okay. Now, here's something we found with the three-factor model. I knew there was probably a small cap bias to this, and indeed there is. The returns come back towards the middle, the higher up you get. If you're playing much over a billion in market cap, it's yeah, you might as well have an index fund. But like I had to invert it. I had to ask, what happens if you only deal with the smallest of stocks and let that illiquidity work in our favor? Uh, as we've talked a lot about the Ibbotson studies and other things, illiquid value stocks are the best performing uh, class of, of stocks since um, you know the set 1970s uh, all the way up through the end of his test, which I think was in 2011. So let's just look at those stocks and see what happens. I'm not even going to give you the numbers. They're sick, stupid, ridiculously high rates of return. Way lumpy in the years following, like the three years following the sell off in 2008 and uh, back in the early 2000s, these numbers are the stuff of absolute legend. Okay, they're huge. I've experienced some of that, uh, so I know that, that that's probably pretty accurate. I owned a lot of these little stocks, they're stocks nobody's ever heard of, and the only one that ever will hear of them is you if you choose to play this under 20 million cheap, well financed stock game. The returns can be enormous. Now, what are the disadvantages? The, you're going to have to deal with slippage and limit orders. They can be very frustrating and difficult to trade at times. You're not always going to be able to get out of your entire position at the exact moment that you wish to get out. So you, you have to kind of think and plan your exit and entry strategy, for that matter, a little better than if you were just firing off a couple hundred shares of Apple. Also, never going to put a ton of money to work here. Okay, it's There's a very limited amount of cash that you can put in there's plenty of these stocks but you know there's just not the liquidity to put in tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars or anything like that to work in the space that's why you don't see any funds or strategies really focused on this idea it can be very profitable do not ignore the smaller well-financed cheap stocks that you run across in your screens and your day-to-day -day activities if you can get a position in a diversified portfolio of these things the returns can be um, quite profitable, to say the least. Mr. Ibbotson was quite quite right. Most of us are paying for liquidity we simply do not need in our role as long-term individual investors. So, Now, the best performing, most consistent screen, this is going to come a shocker to those of you who didn't know me and know my focus over the last couple of years. I was pleased to find that the most consistent performing screen was, of course, small bank stocks with less than $300 million in total assets. These uh, nice little banks did uh, about 21% a year. I'm sorry, 300 million total market cap, <laughs> my mistake. Um, did consistently between 20 and 25% a year over the uh, 5, 10, and 15 year periods. Beat the market by a little bit last year. Um, I look forward to continue to do so going forward as we're seeing the merger wave pick up. Uh, we had a merger this year, this week, uh, in one of our uh, bonus picks that we put out there. These are the banks that are too small to go into the regular portfolio because we can't guarantee that everybody will get filled or that our own buying won't artificially inflate the performance. So we put them out as bonus picks and don't count them with portfolio performance. But Fairmount Bank up in Baltimore was trading around 70% of the book when we picked it up. Had a strong activist investor, really nice balance sheet and loan portfolio. Uh, put that out on December 22nd and Merry Christmas. It's taken over this week for a very quick 30% gain. 
normally we don't get our gains that quickly, but we'll take them. So uh, the bank merger wave is, I think, going to accelerate. Uh, somebody pointed out to me last week that now it's not just the regulatory costs that are becoming a drag, but the costs of technology in order to keep up with larger competitors is also starting to be a problem for many of these smaller banks. So that was the best performing screen. And uh, I got to tell you, we, we're going to get a little more quantitative uh, in our two monthly publications. We're going to track all of these portfolios going forward uh, in the bottom decile report, soon to be named the uh, Deep Value Investor Report or something along those lines, depending if the name is not being widely used by some other newsletter. It'll be some variation on that because we are going to swing out just a little bit away from pure price to book value to include the Graham uh, two-factor PE model. Uh, we'll be following the Piotrowski and Altman cheap stocks. And of course, we'll be uh, screening each month for the stocks that hit my three-factor model. I will not be breaking out the under $20 million stocks for you. Um, that's just Wow, they're volatile. The returns are huge. You know, I can imagine. But when you see them, don't ignore them. There can be some real gems down there. But then the monthly part of the banking on profit service, um, we'll be tracking uh, portfolios of smaller banks uh, in the screening process. We're also added to focus stocks each month. Where we find two of these safe and cheap small banks, and we're just going to highlight what's going on. Uh, who's been buying them, who owns them, what the balance sheet looks like, what the loan portfolio looks like. I think that'll be very useful to some of you um, in putting together a market-beating portfolio of small banks. You can get either of those as a standalone uh, for 99 bucks for the year, or they're free if you subscribe to the regular deep value report or the regular banking on profit service. Now, that's kind of the way I would go, but I'm going to put a link up that will take you to my MarketFi page. You can kind of look through, see what's available, and decide for yourself. All this testing and screening, it works. It works really well. It takes patience and discipline, especially in times like right now when we've had a six-year bull market run and we're holding lots of cash in the regular deep value portfolio. We're fully invested over on the bank stock side. Um, but for regular deep value investors, this can be a little frustrating. Uh, so the returns are lumpy. This all happens over extended periods of time. But there's an enormous amount of, be, of money to be made here. So anyway, that's it for me. I'm off to grab a little lunch, take the dog for a walk, watch a baseball game while I read a book. And that's going to be my preparation for Monday morning. And I'll talk to you guys next week.